discuss a subject even more near and dear to you than what we discussed last week. Last week, we discussed wealth. <laughs> this week, we will discuss independence. All of you would like to feel that you're in charge of your life, right? If you're not in charge of your life right now, you dream of when you'll be in charge of your life. But how much independence do we actually have? Upon reading Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, you become aware for the first time of how tiny your independence is and how you're drowning in an ocean of dependencies. You see, in material life, but beyond the child phase, to be dependent on someone else is considered a sign of weakness. So therefore, in your march through the material world, you always want to profile yourself as being able to take care of yourself, hold your own ground, and move forward on your terms. Then the world glorifies you as a successful human being. But how free of dependencies can you really be? Bhagavad Gita focuses your attention on your equipment. First you have to understand the equipment that you're operating with, and then you can understand the extent of your accomplishments, what your situation actually is. So Krishna in Bhagavad Gita describes that you have the Garmendriyas, Sanskrit for your working senses, your senses that are used to grab things. <laughs> and then you have your Ganendriyas, your knowledge acquiring senses. With that equipment, you seek to make your way through the world. So much so that when you talk about your body, when you refer to your body, you're actually referring to a bag of senses. People in the Western world normally don't think about their body that way. They just think it's my body and it does things and it feels things. But to view your body as a bag of senses allows you to start seeing what you're actually doing. The senses are pursuing sense objects. So this might sound quite uh, devoid of warmth, devoid of sensitivity. That you mean all that's going on throughout my day and night is that my senses are trying to pursue sense objects. So if that's the case, if the senses are always pursuing the sense objects, and the sense objects are always entering in to the senses, how can I ever escape that trap? This loop that goes on and on and on. This is a question that the great devotee Uddhava asked Lord Krishna. You'll find in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uddhava is wondering, how can there ever be self-realization? How can there ever be enlightenment? if the senses are always chasing the sense objects and the sense objects are always embedded in the senses. It's a two-way street. It's going on all the time. How will you ever escape this? It seems like you're doomed. You can't stop your senses from reaching out and grabbing things. And you can't keep the sense objects out of your mind. You see, in Bhagavad Gita, the mind is also considered a sense. So, these sense objects are lodging themselves within your mind, and your senses are pursuing the sense objects. So, Uddhava's very practical question, very important question for your daily practice of bhakti. How is self-realization possible when this constant loop is going on? So, what is Krishna's answer? Krishna explained that on the level of ordinary life, you cannot escape this loop. You'll never become self-realized. 
you'll never make any spiritual advancement on this ordinary level of human life in which the senses are always pursuing the objects and the objects are always lodging themselves in the senses. So what to do? Albert Einstein gives you a hint, although he never knew that what he said would be applied the way I'm using it now. <laughs> he said that a problem is never solved on the same level upon which the problem was created. <laughs> so in other words, if you actually want to solve a problem, you have to go to a higher level and look down on that problem. Otherwise, on the same level, you'll never be able to work it out. You'll never be able to find a solution. So Krishna says in Srimad Bhagavatam that for the transcendentalist who goes above the level of material senses and material sense objects, he or she can achieve the real solution. In other words, when you engage in bhakti, bhakti is performed with your senses for the pleasure of the master of the senses. When you do that, you're no longer trapped on the ordinary level where this loop goes around and round and round nonstop. And you get tired of that loop, but you don't know any other way of life. With my senses, I pursue sense objects. The sense objects are lodging themselves in my senses, especially my mind. That's life. What do you want out of me? I didn't make life this way. I'm just trying to do my best. I wouldn't do all that. You're just trying to do your best. <laughs> and there's even a sense of resignation. Look, what do you want out of me? <laughs> right? You would, you would look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're not the greatest saint, right? But nor are you the greatest sinner. So, <laughs> right? just leave it at that. <laughs> With that idea of resignation, that syndrome of resignation, you then proceed through your material life playing the game of musical chairs. How is that? <laughs> Many of you as children have <clears throat> played this game. And actually, as adults, Many are still playing that game. That is, get what you can, and then when the music stops, make sure you have a chair. <laughs> Perhaps you can remember as little kids, when the music stopped, <laughs> you panicked. Oh, I can't be left without a chair. I even tried to squeeze onto the same chair as another kid, you remember? You just didn't want to be left without a chair. It was a hardly embarrassing feeling. So this is how we have been trained to proceed in life. We've been hardwired in this way. So much conditioning. Get as much as you can before the music stops. And when the music stops, make sure you've got your chair. This is considered civilization. And in the process of this civilization, so-called civilization, uh, people are cracking up. <laughs> they're full of inner despair and emptiness, whether they're rich or poor. We discussed that last week. Krishna's solution in Bhagavad Gita is that we learn what to actually do with our senses. We connect our senses to non-material sense objects and in that way, our material senses become spiritualized. That's why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, whatever you do, do as an offering for him. You offer the results to Krishna. And in that way, your activities are not on the normal level of human affairs. In that way, you escape that non-stop loop of the senses running towards the sense objects and the sense objects lodging themselves in the senses. You've escaped by connecting to Krishna. You've gone to a higher level. Indeed, you've gone to the highest level. There you have the real solution to your individual problems and to the collective problems of human society. As long as we think we're independent in material existence, we won't feel sufficient incentive for our spiritual development. 
Independence seems to be so near and dear to us, but actually we have so little of it. Try to think now how little independence you have. You didn't ask for the particular body that you have. Now, material nature forced a particular body on you. Krishna explains according to your mentality and your karma from your previous birth. But you didn't put your hand up for a certain kind of body. <laughs> material nature forces it on you as the suitable vehicle to match your state of consciousness, to match your desires. So here we are embedded in material nature and embedded in these material bodies and minds. Yet we think that we have so many options, we have so many alternatives. In our class this morning, we are listening to Srila Prabhupada give a very graphic example, which can easily be understood by anyone who has a, a pet dog and you've taken the dog for a walk. You have the dog on a leash and you're walking in the dog in a park maybe or just a, around the block or something like that. And the dog is so happy to get out of the house. The tail of the dog is wagging. It feels so sprightly and enthusiastic. But how much freedom does the dog actually have? The dog is only as free as the length of the leash. But you can't really tell the dog that. <laughs> the dog is so happy to move a little bit this way, move a little bit that way, sniff a tree here, sniff a tree there. <laughs> Dare we to see our life in that way? Oh, no. <laughs> Dare we to consider our life in the same way? But actually, we don't have that many options. We're held tight by the leech of material nature. We have a limited set of options given in terms of this body and what this body can do. But in our mind, we imagine we have so many possibilities. But actually, when you look at those possibilities, they're quite limited. So we can make a big deal out of the choices that we encounter in life. Should I buy my pizza from this place, Pizza Hut, or should I go to Dominic's Pizza? This is a big joy. <laughs> Should I go out with Jill instead of Jane? Oh, it's a big joy. But from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita, it's a very narrow choice because you are being dictated by Rajoguna, the mode of passion. Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita a very deep Sanskrit verse. Prakrite Kriyamana. Gunai dharmani sarvasha. Ahamkara kumudatma kataham itimanute. The fool doesn't see that all his or her activities are being forced on you by material nature. Instead of understanding that, the fool thinks, I am the doer. I am the cause of my activities. When actually you're being dragged around by material nature. How is that? You see your body, that bag of senses, remember, the body, is composed of influences according to your previous life. Susceptibilities. The body is composed of material nature and that means three qualities. Goodness, passion, and ignorance. So according to your past life, you have predispositions toward the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance. And these days, mostly what you're seeing is passion and ignorance. You don't see too much goodness as defined in Bhagavad Gita. The mode of goodness as defined in Bhagavad Gita is very serene and a very knowledgeable state in which you are in full control of your senses and you're living a very purified lifestyle and you know how to stay clear of bad karma activities. But no one knows that today. So what you see today is intense hankering 
longing, desiring, the fire of desire. That's even glorified these days. Someone who has fiery desire is considered to be a worthwhile human being. <laughs> to want something, to desire to achieve, to desire to acquire. Indeed, people may even compliment you. Maybe some of you heard others tell you, you have a real lust for life. <laughs> you took it. They call it such a compliment. <laughs> and the mode of ignorance, tamoguna, means once you fry yourself out, <laughs> striving for things, you want to become intoxicated so you forget all your troubles. You, or you just want to sleep all the time. So that's basically what's going on today. There's practically very little influence of uh, sattvaguna, the mode of goodness, in which people are very reflective, they know how to control their senses, uh, they can understand that they're different from the body. That's the material mode of goodness. That's not the transcendental level. So here we are, embedded in these machines given by material nature. And Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Yantra Bhut, Yantra Bhutan Mahaya. <clears throat> these yantras, these machines, uh, composed of material nature, <clears throat> encase you, the spirit soul. And so actually, in your mind, you're imagining that you are the big chooser, but you're acting according to your susceptibilities. How your body is predisposed to passion or ignorance. And also, how outside of you, uh, the modes of material nature are affecting you. Just like winds are blowing here and there. So, when you are hit by the material influence of passion, and you have that natural bodily susceptibility to passion, you have to act passionately. But you think, ah, oh, it's me, I'm choosing Jill, uh, it's all me. <laughs> when actually you're just being pushed around by the modes of material nature. So Krishna in Bhagavad Gita is trying to get you to see how dependent you are. How dependent you are on your material body, your material mind, how you are dependent on your material resources, that everyone can understand. Oil dependencies, natural gas dependencies. But they don't see how dependent they are on their material body and mind as sources of satisfaction. And that is a big mistake. People are worried about dependency on foreign oil as a big mistake, uh, dependency on this resource or that resource. But in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna trains you up to understand how dependency on your body and mind of matter is an extreme mistake. Because you're not material, so how can you depend on matter for your fulfillment, for your satisfaction? So Bhagavad Gita is seeking to give you the knowledge that truly empowers you. How to make an actual solution to this false sense of independence. Your body changes. No one here asked to be born. No one asked to grow older. No one asked to get sick. And no one asked to die. But these things are forced upon you. Yet we see so little opportunity for independence and we just blow it all out of proportion. Guess what I chose to do last weekend? We make such a big thing out of it. It's like prisoners in prison. <laughs> and if you've been a good prisoner, maybe one day they say, okay, you can choose. <laughs> do you want rye bread or do you want wheat bread? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we make such a big thing out of it. It shows how desperate we are and also shows how ignorant we are, how we lack knowledge. So when Krishna says you have no independence, Krishna is not taking very seriously this tiny scope of choice that we have. It's so <laughs> insignificant. It's not what we're talking about. In other words, we make a big thing out of should I live in L.A. or should I live in San Francisco? Oh, it's crucial. 
right decision. But from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita, it's not important at all. The important decision is, should I come out of the grip of material nature, or should I not? But we make such a big thing out of various statuses within the prison. When I'm speaking in South Africa, I give the example of how when Nelson Mandela was in famous, the infamous prison on Robben Island, according to your, because it's during apartheid times in South Africa, according to your ethnicity, you got a different meal. If you were a European prisoner, you got two biscuits, along with your rule or whatever else they serve. If you're Indian, you got one biscuit, along with your rule. If you're African, no biscuits. Just a <laughs> so, would you make a big deal out of, oh, I'm getting two biscuits. <laughs> I'm such a high class prisoner. <laughs> no, you want to get out of prison. <laughs> and besides that apartheid system for feeding the prisoners and also clothing them, according to your ethnicity, they allowed you you know, certain articles of clothing. <laughs> so, uh, besides that, according to your behavior in the prison, you'd be classified as Class D prisoner, Class C, Class B, and Class A. And you were treated uh, harshly or not, uh, comparatively, according to your classification. So, uh, Nelson Mandela, he was telling some young radicals, he was older, but there were some young radicals who were in prison along with him. And they were just wanting to raise hell in the prison. We're not cooperating, we're not doing what we're told, we're going to just, uh, we're going to make a ruckus at every step. Uh, and he told them, hey, let me tell you guys one thing. You're going to be here for a while. <laughs> So you better learn how to cope. <laughs> so at first they made fun of him. Oh, you old fogey. No, we're, no, we're going to upset everything. We're going to cause a big disturbance inside prison. So they couldn't, but <laughs> speaking that better. So he finally convinced them that you've got to do two things at once. I was explaining this also when I spoke at the Google campus uh, a few days ago. He explained that... <clears throat> You've got to adapt to prison life so that things aren't completely hellish, while at the same time always plotting what you're going to do when you get out and, and how to aid the freedom struggle from even while you're in prison. So try to live in prison in such a way that it's not as hellish as it can be, while at the same time always working for your ultimate liberation in a political sense. So I explained uh, in, when I'm speaking in South Africa that you take this in advice in terms of the, a yogi's efforts within the material world. We don't say just forget about the material world and ignore your material situation. No, you do the best you can. Just like if you were in that prison on Robben Island. If you got to be a class A prisoner, like Mandela did, you get some perks. And they made a little bit of difference. But uh, none of the prisoners there ever thought, now I'm a class A prisoner, my work is done. No, they're always scheming when we get out. <laughs> and how do we contact our comrades clandestinely from within the prison? How do we keep pushing the liberation movement? So they have two things going on at once. How to deal with the present circumstances in an appropriate way, while always keeping their vision on the main goal, which was become relatively free. So I give that example to show how a bhakti yogi takes this world. It's not that uh, we cut ourselves off from any conveniences, cut ourselves off from any uh, any perks, so to speak. Our main goal, our main vision is how to escape dependency on material nature. How to become truly free. 
So it's uh, a combined process of dealing with the temporary so that you achieve the eternal. This is brilliant technology. Indeed, how to use the temporary to achieve the eternal. This is the high spiritual technology that Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita. Not to ignore your body, not to ignore your mind, not to ignore your surroundings, but to use your body, mind, and surroundings so that you achieve the highest goal. So in this political example, uh, Nelson Mandela taught the young fire-breathing revolutionaries that he told them, I'm not, I'm not a fool. I'm not trying to just uh, mm, surrender to the system. I'm being practical. Uh, meanwhile, I'm doing my best to aid the freedom struggle outside the prison. And we're also making plans because we know one day we're getting out. We know our time will come. So similarly, Krishna's devotee deals with the material world expertly. Look at Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. He was an expert military man. He could deal with the world for the highest purpose. That's what Krishna wants. Don't try to deal with this world for the sake of your own selfish interests. See the interests of the Supreme. And that vision of the interests of the Supreme, of Krishna, requires, uh, you require training and education to be able to have that vision. To be able to recognize freedom and strive for it. So, to my audiences in South Africa, I, I quoted a statement I saw on a billboard uh, by Mandela. And of course, it, it's, he meant it strictly in terms of politics. There's no such thing as partial freedom. <laughs> so, wow! <laughs> Actually, that is the message of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, there's no such thing as real freedom on the material platform. In other words, we may think, I can choose Domino's Pizza instead of Pizza Hut. Therefore, freedom. <laughs> But at best, you can call that partial freedom. But then again, what is partial freedom? What, why not have full freedom? And that's what Krishna is offering in Bhagavad Gita. To free the spirit soul from being embedded in matter and being pushed around by material nature. That is real freedom. So therefore, from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita, there is indeed no such thing as partial freedom. Freedom within the material energy is partial freedom. And actually there's no such thing. You're either in material existence or you're out of material existence. And Krishna wants you out. You can be out of material nature even while within material nature if you follow Krishna's instructions. That means you can be liberated from material nature even while apparently being within material nature. That is the highest spiritual technology. So again, let's consider how independent are we really? I was talking to one young man today and also I was talking to uh, some nieces and nephews I visited yesterday in Manhattan Beach. And they all were broadcasting the same message. They were 17 or so, and they're about to go off to college, away from home. And they all had that glint in their eyes. We're getting away from mommy and daddy. <laughs> Life is really going to begin now. <laughs> Maybe some of you can remember. <laughs> what it was like to finally get away. So they had a glint in their eyes. Independence, freedom. Uh, we can make our own way <laughs> without mommy trying to tuck us in every night. <laughs> that glint in their eye showing you that the living entity really wants freedom but has no idea how to get it. At the university, they're going to have to study. Uh, they're going to 
they have to put in an effort, and then when they graduate from college, they have to uh, seek out a job. So actually, where is the freedom? But material nature always offers you something, like a carrot in front of the donkey. Just keep stepping, it's out there, freedom. <laughs> And especially, the process of sense gratification makes us think we're free, when actually we are the slave of our senses. You see, when we are hallucinating that we are enjoying, we don't see that we're actually a servant. And that's why it's sometimes hard for us to understand that in all circumstances, we are a servant. Either you serve Krishna's senses or you serve material nature. That is the choice. Your independence really is that tiny. You simply can choose, should I serve Krishna's senses and do everything for Krishna's pleasure? Or should I serve material nature? In any case, you're a servant. But you see, there's something about indulging in maya, the illusory energy, that makes you think, even though you're being a complete slave, a complete servant, you're thinking, I am free, I am enjoying. And all you're doing is serving. Try to catch yourself doing this. You're serving your mind, you're serving your senses. But you think, I have this sense of temporary enjoyment, therefore, I'm the master. <laughs> but actually, you're completely submitting. What do my senses want? What does my mind tell me? Let them dictate to me. After all, they're mine. It's my mind, my senses. Because I'm serving my mind and serving my senses, I must be free. We don't see it as imprisonment. We don't see it as slavery. That we're actually serving. So if you can detect this paradox, how the illusory energy fools us, that just because we imagine we're enjoying, we totally forget that we are the servant. I was watching yesterday one of my relatives, and he was at the beck and call of his family members. But because he was feeling, it's my family, therefore he didn't mind being ordered around. Yes, dear, certainly dear. As you like, dear. <laughs> and his children were also, Father, I want this. Father, I would like that. Just be patient. I'll get it for you. Just be patient. He imagined he was in control. <laughs> but actually, he's submitting to everyone's demands. But because there's this sense of, it's my body and my family, you forget that you're a servant. So this is what Maya does to us. So what is Krishna's answer to all that? Does Krishna say, don't have a body, don't have a family? Yes and no. <laughs> you see, we don't belong in these material bodies. We're pure spirit soul, part of Krishna. And we're meant to be acting as part of Krishna's spiritual association. We've forgotten that. We've, been, we've become bewildered by the loose energy. And so therefore we have these temporary material bodies and these temporary material families. So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is teaching you how to use that temporary body and temporary family for the highest purpose. Again, how to use the temporary to achieve the eternal. How to utilize Krishna's material energy for achieving Krishna. Because the energy belongs to Krishna. So in this way, you can see how Krishna is talking to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, who is a family man and a military man. Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to him. And that way we can understand that Bhagavad Gita applies to our life in every aspect. So while within the material prison, we can try to make life a little more convenient, but that's not our ultimate goal. We have our vision always on life outside the prison. 
and we want to use our time in the prison so that we can increase our spiritual development and help others to increase their spiritual development. That is real life. That is living in the real world. So, again, going back to that point about independence. Why do we love independence? Because we remember faintly our original existence with Krishna. When we are truly independent because we're free from matter, the domination of matter. But we're not independent in the sense that we are God. We're always dependent on Krishna in pure love. That is the perfection of the spiritual world. And that pure love is so attractive that even Krishna himself wants to become dominated by the pure love of his pure devotees. So you see that even the Supreme Absolute Truth, cause of all causes, Krishna, prefers to be dominated by the love of his pure devotees. That pure love is the ultimate deciding factor to come under the influence of pure love. Even Krishna wants that. So here we are thinking to be completely independent, to have no one dominating us, that is the best situation in life. But Krishna wants to come under the control of his pure devotees because their love is flawless without any material condition or motivation. Krishna knows what is the best pleasure to come under the influence of pure love and pure lovers. I often give an example that really brought this home to me. I saw something that reminded me of an example Prabhupada gave. I was at an airport in Melbourne, Australia, and there were about 100 people or so waited at the gate, to, waiting to board a plane. And some were sitting down, and there was a very well-dressed businessman, uh, maybe about 40 years old. His wife was there, and his five-year-old child was with him. And so the man and his wife were seated in the chairs, and the five-year-old girl was standing in front of him, and she would point to the floor. Down, Dad, down! And the man would fall off the chair onto the floor on his back in front of hundreds of persons. <laughs> And the little daughter would just laugh with delight. The man would get up, sit in the chair again, and once more, down, daddy, down. He throws up on the floor, <laughs> on his back. <laughs> this went on for about 10 times. And I looked around, and everyone watching was thinking, oh, this is so nice. <laughs> but what's actually going on? He, he's relishing being dependent on his little girl. Even though, in terms of material capacity and strength and intelligence, she's far inferior to him, still he loves coming under the influence of her affection and he lets her order him around. So much so that in front of hundreds of persons, he's throwing himself on the floor <laughs> at the command of his young daughter. So there you can see a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. You can now start to understand how Krishna takes the highest pleasure in coming under the control of his devotee's pure love. The man was obviously some kind of executive, yet, although he's used to giving so many orders, he wanted to be commanded by his little daughter's love. Similarly, Krishna, more than creating the material world, more than maintaining the material world or destroying the material world, Krishna would rather come under the control of his pure devotee's love. That's Krishna's highest pleasure. Therefore, in the topmost portion of the spiritual world, pure love reigns supreme. And Krishna himself agrees voluntarily to come under the control of pure so this idea of independence we have is it's totally bogus. <laughs> you can't even have it. The idea is wrong and you can't actually have it anyway in the material world. 
We cannot become free from dependencies in the material world. You're always dependent on this or that. Just think of your attempts for pleasure. Your attempts for pleasure and happiness are dependent on so many circumstances. One little thing goes wrong, and your pleasure is ruined, your happiness is ruined. So Krishna points out in Bhagavad Gita that this is not real happiness. You're bound up by material nature. But you're thinking you are independent, you are the doer. Kataham iti manyate. Ahamkara vamudatma. Krishna says, because of false ego, you have these false ideas. So bhakti means to purify that false ego in which you think you are the body, you are the mind, and everything in relation to the body and mind is yours. Purify that, and your real ego emerges. Hey, I am Krishna's servant. I am part of Krishna, meant to exist in a relationship of pure love with Krishna. That is real ego, and that is the goal of the bhakti yoga system. You cannot annihilate your real ego. You are always Krishna's servant. Forget that, and then in material nature, you'll be serving material nature, which belongs to Krishna. But Krishna wants you to serve him directly. Use your senses to serve Krishna directly. That is the perfection known as the bhakti yoga system. So are there any questions? Krishna, 
while being a slave of material nature. Okay? So we have a short, but for now, um, we're going to do the main part of the initiation ceremony by giving him his new name and you'll hear him recite his vows. And then you all can bestow upon him your good wishes, your blessings, and so forth. And it's a good time for many of you to think that you could also do this. So we're going to call up this devotee, Mahesh. Please come and nearby so his family could be closer. So in this way he's using his independence, his tiny independence to come closer to Krishna. Therefore that tiny independence has uh, immeasurable merit. Even though it's tiny. <laughs> the foolish use of independence is well should I live in this place far away from the temple or that place far away from the temple. But he's thinking, I have a family, I have a job, but I also want to keep Krishna in the center of my life. So what would be the best decision for accomplishing that purpose? So in his case, it's all working for him in this way. The whole point is how to use your intelligence to make a decision for your family that's best for the goal of becoming devotees of Krishna. The circumstances may vary because everyone has different family circumstances. But the principle is true for us all. Whatever decision you make in terms of practically living in, practically living in this world, always make the bottom line. What is best for the family's spiritual advancement? Alright, what are the four rules? Intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex, and no duty. And what to do every day? I will chant 16 rounds minimum every day. All right. I'm very happy that you're an active member of the New Dwarka community under the guidance of His Grace Temple President Subhas Prabhu. So, your new name now is Gauranga Chandra Das. <laughs> Chandra means Goranga, Lord Chaitanya, Chandra, the moon, that brilliant shining moon of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you.